Okay guys, for chapter four, I'm going to break the videos into smaller sections rather than having one large video. So this is part one. We're going to discuss Newton's second law. As I often do, we're going to start off with a question. So here I have the Earth and it's rotating on its axis. This is what gives us our days. The question I want to ask is what force causes the Earth to rotate around its axis? Before I answer that question, I want to consider another example. So imagine here I have a spaceship, and this spaceship is far from Earth. In fact, it's deep into outer space, far away from any other planets or stars or any large mass sources. It's using a rocket to provide thrust. So that thrust is causing the rocket to accelerate through space, meaning it's going faster and faster. All right, so it's flying along and everything's fine. And then all of a sudden it's fuel runs out. Yeah, I'm gonna pause it right there. So when the fuel runs out, of course, the thrust is gone. The question I wanna consider is, what happens to its motion after this? Read through these options and make your choice. Well, this question should actually look familiar. It's the same one that was on our quiz recently. And the reason why is because we've already considered this, this concept before. To me, the best way to answer this question is to ask this question. What is the net force on the ship? So why don't you think about that? What other forces are there that are acting on the ship? Let's go through some common ones. We're used to dealing with gravity, but in this case, there's no gravity. That was the point of it being in deep outer space, far away from any other masses. So gravity is not there. We know thrust is gone, the fuel ran out. Friction or air resistance is a common one on Earth, but they're in space. This is a vacuum, so there's no air to cause any resistance, nothing for friction to act against. So long story short, there, there is no force. There's no, if there's no force, then there's no net force. So this is another way of representing net force. It's the summation symbol. So if you sum up all the forces, that's what we call the net force. And because there's just simply no forces, you get a net force of zero. Well, if you remember from previous discussions, a net force of zero is what we call equilibrium. A guy named Isaac Newton had done a lot of study on this, and he came up with his first law of motion, which we've discussed before. An object at rest remains at rest, or an object in motion travels at a uniform speed in a straight line unless acted on by a non-zero net force. In our rocket example, we already said that we have a zero net force, so this bottom part is not what we're experiencing. We're not at rest, so we must be here. An object in motion travels at uniform speed in a straight line. So for our rocket example, we should see something like this. When that thrust cuts out, the ship is just gonna continue on at whatever speed it had at the moment it cut out and travel in a straight line. So to answer the question, C was the best option. I should mention that if you chose D, you might want to consider a little more closer because that really doesn't make any sense. All right, so here I've condensed Newton's first law a little bit. The concept of speed and direction is just velocity. So if we take all those terms and combine it into one, then it, we're just left with an object's velocity does not change unless acted upon by a net force. Let's go back to this question. This is a little more complicated because here we're referring to what's known as rotational velocity. 
but it's a similar situation to the rocket where there, there's no forces acting on Earth to cause it to spin up. But in the same regard, there's no forces that are causing it to slow down either. So the Earth doesn't need forces because there's no reason why it would stop spinning. The spin was developed early on in its formation and it's just never had a reason to change. So what exactly does a force do then? Here I want to ask the question, what does a force always do? And in this multiple choice one, I want you to select all of the options that apply. To me, the only real answer is A. A force always pushes or pulls on an object. You might think to yourself, well, wait a second, I've used a force to move an object and I've used a force to change the motion of an object. So why wouldn't those be valid options? Let's go through some examples that will hopefully demonstrate why. Here I have a picture of our textbook. It's sitting on a table. Now, hopefully your textbook hasn't just sat on the table from the first week of class, but we'll see. So in this case, mine is sitting there and I wanna ask the question, are there forces on the book? What do you think? Well, the answer is yes, definitely. Gravity is something we're always dealing with on Earth. You can think of gravity as weight in this situation. So if gravity is pulling down, but the book isn't actually moving down, then there must be something supporting it. So we call that the support force. And because it's at rest, we know we're in a situation of equilibrium. Rest is one example of equilibrium. So let's say the weight of this book is 13 newtons. By the way, that's about three pounds. What would the support force be? Well, if we're going to achieve equilibrium and we only have two forces and they're going in opposite directions, then that force, that support force, has to be 13 newtons. I'm going to modify this situation a little bit. We still have weight. Book hasn't changed. But now I'm pushing down on the book. And I'm pushing down with about 20 newtons of force. The book must still be supported, otherwise it should be moving down. So there's still a support force. The question I want to ask is what is the support force? Nothing's changed concerning equilibrium. The net force still has to be zero. Here we have two downward forces and one upward forces. So everything's got to add together to be zero. If we have two downward forces totaling a with a total of 33 newtons, then the upward force has to be 33 newtons as well. I want you to consider, are any of these forces causing motion or changing motion? And the answer is no, they're not. That brings us back to this question. Hopefully it's a little more clear why A is the only choice because I've mentioned always. So we've shown that a force does not always move an object and it does not always change the motion of an object. So that brings another question. What does change motion? Let's modify our previous example a little bit. In this case, we still have gravity, of course, pulling down with 13 newtons. I have the support force back at 30, 13 newtons because I'm no longer pushing down, I'm pushing horizontally to the left with the same 20 newton force that I'd used before. This is actually a video, so let's watch. <laughs> 
All right, I apologize about the shakiness. I was kind of in a hurry and I was holding the camera with one hand and pushing the book with the other. Not exactly the best setup. Okay, so in this case, why did the same forces in terms of magnitude cause a change in motion? The answer is probably pretty obvious. Because I changed direction of my for my 20 Newton force, I no longer have a net force of zero. A horizontal force will never cancel a vertical force. It doesn't matter what sort of numbers you throw at it. In this case, the vertical forces cancel out just fine, but there's nothing to cancel the horizontal force. Therefore, as I said, I have a net force that is not zero. So let's combine this all down into one cohesive statement. What we've seen is that a change in motion is caused by a non-zero net force. I need to point out though that a change in motion, if we track it with time, that's just acceleration. So we could say instead that an acceleration is caused by a non-zero net force. I want to ask though, is an acceleration equal to net force? That's an important question. To me, the best way to answer it is to look at something called units. Units give you the dimensionality of the quantities you're trying to represent. So we're going to consider units. For acceleration, we have distance divided by time squared. A good way to compare units is to use what's called standard, standard international units, or SI units. So in SI units, distance is a meter and time is in seconds. So acceleration is the typical meters per second squared. Force, if you remember, is defined as a Newton. I've just been using N to represent Newton. But Newtons actually break down into the basic, uh, basic SI units as kilograms meters per second squared. They both have meters squared in them. The difference is right here. So because they don't have the same SI units, they are not the same quantity. So they can't be equal to each other. This is still useful though, and Newton spent a lot of time studying this topic and what he decided was that the acceleration of a body is directly proportional to and in the same direction as the net force acting on it. This is commonly referred to as Newton's second law of motion. I should point out this is kind of an early version. I'm gonna highlight a couple issues with this. The first is same direction. If acceleration and net force have the same direction, here's an example. If the net force is downward, then the acceleration is downward. So it's just always the case. If you know the direction of one, you know the direction of other. I do need to point out though, that the direction of the acceleration is not always the same as the direction of motion. Let me give you an example. So let's go back to free fall. We've studied this in the past. In free fall, we know that the acceleration is gonna be 10 meters per second squared, roughly, but that acceleration is gonna be down. It's always down. Because we know the direction of acceleration, we know that the net force is gonna be down as well. Although not necessarily equal, that's why I tried to use different lengths. All right. What I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna to toss the box up into the air. And let's just stop it right there. As the box was traveling upward, its velocity was upward. So in this case, you can see an example of when the acceleration and the velocity are not in the same direction. Notice in this example, the object happened to be slowing down. The connection between velocity and acceleration direction gets kind of complicated and it's beyond the scope of this class. So I'm not gonna go into it any further. If you're interested, we do cover it in our more advanced physics courses. For now, I'm just gonna make the statement the direction of the net force or acceleration, because they're the same, is not always the direction an object moves. So that's important that you have that in your mind 
Just because you know that the net force is left doesn't mean the object is going to go to the left. The other thing I want to point out about this early version is the term directly proportional. How a direct proportionality works is it's, it's often referred to as a one-to-one -one relationship. So for example, if acceleration is doubled, the net force is doubled. Another example, if the acceleration is reduced by two a third, then the net force is reduced to one third. So it's a one-to-one -one relation. Whatever happens to one, that same multiplicative factor happens to the other one as well. Mathematically, how we can write that is with the proportional to sign. So this is saying that the net force is proportional to acceleration. But in physics, what we really want is an equality. We want that proportional to become an equal sign. So in order to do that, we're missing something. What is that missing link? In this previous slide, we already hinted at the missing link. In terms of units, we showed that acceleration had meters per second squared and force had meters per second squared. The difference was kilograms. So that is what's missing. Kilograms represents mass. I should point out that this is mass, not weight. Later, we'll get into the difference between mass and weight. But for now, just know that it's mass. So with that connection, Newton's second law can be written as net force equals mass times acceleration. Here I've used their simplified symbolic forms. This is, you might have heard the phrase F equals MA before, that's where this comes from. Although I do want to point out that it's not F, it's F net. That's an important distinction. If I do a little algebra on this, I can rearrange it to say that the acceleration is equal to the net force divided by the mass. I actually know a lot of physicists that think this is really the way people should remember it. And I happen to agree with them. The point is that when you look at this and say F equals MA, it makes it sound like acceleration gives you net force, but it's not true. That's not how it works. What happens is you create a net force, you push until it's an uneven balance, and that produces an acceleration. So it doesn't happen the other way around. So this is a useful way to think about it. So let's look at that form a little closer. The other thing is it shows the connection or the relation between acceleration and mass. This type of mathematical relationship is known as an inverse proportionality. So acceleration is inversely proportional to mass. What that means is, well, let's go through an example. If your mass is cut in half, then your acceleration is doubled. Or another example, if your mass is tripled, then your acceleration is reduced to one third of its original value. So hopefully that's becoming clear. So the idea of an inverse is, let's say your mass gets quadrupled, so four times more mass. Your acceleration would then be the inverse of that, which is one fourth. So the inverse of four is one fourth, and the inverse of one fourth is four. That's the kind of relationship that acceleration and mass have. Let's put this all together with one last example. Remember the video, the, the amazing video that I showed you of the book sliding to the left. Let's say that during that motion, at this moment, the book was moving with constant velocity. And I want to ask the question, what is the, fric the force of friction acting on the book? Obviously, there's friction. I mean, we just know from everyday experience that it's very hard to get rid of friction. So how would we determine what that force of friction would be? Well, let's make a connection to Newton's second law. There's a key word here, though, constant velocity. So hopefully from, you remember from previous discussion, constant velocity is zero acceleration. Remember, acceleration is change in velocity. So if you have no change in velocity, you have zero acceleration. But now we know that zero acceleration means 
zero net force, which is a condition of equilibrium. And notice again, equilibrium doesn't mean it's at rest. It could mean it's moving. It just can't be accelerating. So the velocity just can't be changing. So let's use that to determine our frictional force. Here, our vertical vectors cancel out just fine. It was this horizontal one that we were dealing with. Friction, in order to give us a net force of zero, has to be opposing or opposite my push in this case. That's going to go to the right. We'll call that our friction vector. And in order to get a net force of zero, that's going to be exactly 20 newtons. Here's an example of how we can use Newton's second law. We have a 1200 kilogram rocket generating 600 newtons of force, and it wants to know what is the acceleration of the rocket. Newton's second law tells us that the net force should be equal to the mass of the rocket times its acceleration. Now for this problem, we're gonna assume that the 600 newtons really is the net force. If we sh can't assume that, then they should have explained more in the problem. So we can rearrange this to solve for acceleration. It's just the net force over the mass. Plugging in our values. If you remember from our earlier discussion of units, that actually does simplify down to meters per second squared. We're gonna go ahead and end here. This was just part one of our chapter four. In the next segment, we'll get more into friction and drag.